Welcome to chapter 5 of our textbook. Um, today we are talking about space, time, and motion. Illusion of space. Actual space refers to the three dimensions of our environments, the dimensions in which we live and move. Sculpture occupies actual space and freestanding sculptures can be observed from every angle. Consider, uh, say you have an apple in your hand. You can hold the apple, you can spin the apple in every direction, you can set the apple on the table. That apple has volume, it has mass, it takes up actual space. Sculptures are objects that take up actual space. Paintings and drawings, though they are objects in themselves, they are used because they are flat surfaces. And those surfaces, the artist can create the illusion of space. The illusion of space is the suggestion of three dimensions on a two-dimensional surface. Illusion of space is sometimes called implied space or pictorial space. So, looking at your television screen, that is the illusion of space when you're looking into the television screen. Even consider a mirror in your bathroom. Look into the mirror in your bathroom and you have an illusion of space. That mirror is in fact a flat surface. Paintings and drawings, again, they are flat surfaces and often artists work to create an illusion of space on the flat surfaces. There are many different methodologies that an artist will use to uh, really create the illusion of space and these are some of what we'll be talking about. Relative size, overlapping, atmospheric perspective, linear perspective, one-point perspective, and two-point perspective. Relative size. One way in which artists suggest space is varying the size of objects and figures. Objects and figures that are supposed to appear closer to the viewer will be sized larger than objects and figures of the same type that are perceived as farther away. We have a silhouette of a person here and uh, this person is very large as compared to this person or these people. In fact, the people get smaller the farther they are away. So because of the, the method of, of, of thinking about relative size, we know that, a, that people who appear bigger are in fact closer to us. And that is true with other sizes or other objects in a landscape or in any sort of artwork. Another thing we innately understand is overlapping. Overlapping creates the illusion of space through imitating the real world effect of closer objects obscuring objects that are farther away. Overlapping often works hand in hand with relative size. So, what objects are the closest to us in this image? Well, first off, I would say this tree or whatever is going on here because this is in front 
of these houses or structures? What object is farthest away from us? Well, it's these towers or this building here. How do we know that? Because we cannot depend on relative size in this instance because these are all dissimilar objects. We know that this is farther away because it's behind this. And this is farther away than these, which are farther away than this tree. That is overlapping. When you cannot depend on relative size, you can look into or think about the overlapping of objects. So a question for you is what object in this image is closest to you? Well, I would say this pumpkin looking thing, this little tiny pumpkin is closest to us because it's in front of all of these things. That apple might come in a close second. The farthest away thing is this glass container. In this painting, I believe what we're looking at is a circular tabletop. And on that circular tabletop, we have a newspaper, a bottle of wine, or whatever Banyuls is, a coffee cup, I see a pipe, and I see this thing that might be a tobacco box. Well, in this abstract artwork, things might seem a little bit wacky in terms of the placement of the objects, but the question is, which object is closest to us? Well, maybe it is this box. Maybe it is the wine. Maybe it is the coffee cup. But I know that it's not the newspaper because the wine and the box are in front of the newspaper. In fact, the newspaper looks like it's in front of the coffee cup. So the coffee cup is probably behind the newspaper. And the newspaper is behind the wine. And the wine is maybe behind the box. It's just my instinct that it's behind the box. And then the pipe is maybe on the same level as the box. Another thing that I know for a fact is that the table, this roundish thing in the background, but that's behind everything. So even in abstract artwork, we have overlapping. And the overlapping creates a hierarchy of how we can understand where the objects are placed in our, from our vantage point, which is closest to us, creating the illusion of space. This painting is a great example of what is called atmospheric perspective. Atmospheric perspective includes all of the elements 
all these little cute uh, clues and details that suggest that one thing might be farther away and another thing might be closer. That includes overlapping. That includes relative size. But it also includes saturation. So the do, do you remember saturation? Saturation is how uh, much color, how vibrant the color is versus how dull the color is. We also have um, value and contrast. Think of what we learned last week in terms of color. Think of what we learned uh, just a moment ago. Combine all of these elements together. Think about the patterns and how the painting is arranged. And then we can really understand what atmospheric perspective is and how this painting in particular is creating perspective. My definition of atmospheric perspective is a technique for illustrating depth that recreates the indistinct quality of distant objects based on the atmosphere between those objects and the viewer. Atmospheric perspective incorporates devices such as texture, gradient, brightness, gradient. One more time. Incorporates devices such as texture gradient, brightness gradient, color saturation, and the interplay of warm and cool colors. Let's talk about those one by one. Texture gradient. In this instance, texture is really created in the painting by looking at what is the difference between black and white. We we're talking about contrast, but we were talking about contrast on a very small scale. So we're talking about the texture of the leaves on this tree versus the texture in this area or farther back in the horizon. You see even more texture here and on this tree than you do on this tree. To create perspective, there is a texture gradient you see more texture close up and less texture far away. The mountains, imagine how much texture is on the mountains and they are totally smooth. That is an ex this painting is an extreme example of atmospheric perspective but also a texture gradient. Brightness gradient. The colors are very bright, they're very vivid, and they're very saturated, close up. But in the distance, they actually turn brown. Think about how lush this valley is. And think about where you're standing as you're looking over the valley. You're in a very green area. Well, if you were to hike 10 miles into the horizon where the land is brown in this image, do you think that when you look all around, you'll see brown trees or will you see green trees? You'll see green trees. That's the answer. You'll see green trees when you're there. But when you're looking there from 10 miles away, all the colors, the greens, the yellows, the reds, the blues, they all blend together with your vision and they come out as brown. So when you're looking at a landscape, you'll see that the colors are much more vivid when they're closer to you and much less vivid brown or gray deep in the distance. So color saturation, that is similar to the brightness gradient. 
the interplay of warm and cool colors. So again, you have a greater, the potential for a greater uh, variation of warm and cool colors closer to you than in farther away. But in general, you see the cooler colors closer to you maybe in some instances warmer colors but you see them closer to you but in the background that again the colors turn gray so there's a gradient from where you're standing all the way to the horizon in this painting we see we're also seeing relative size relative size so this tree is huge compared to this tree this tree is bigger than those mountains bigger than these trees the trees get smaller as they go back the landscape gets sort of bite-sized as it goes back this is relative size and we also have overlapping the trees overlapping the landscapes in different ways and then the mountains in the background. All of this put together creates the illusion of space by means of recreating or creating the suggestion of atmosphere. Atmosphere being, you know, the, the haze in the distance. This is atmospheric perspective. When you're not standing on a hilltop, maybe you're standing around your building in a house, looking down a hallway, standing on some train tracks, you'll see linear perspective. Linear perspective refers to formal systems developed by artists to portray three-dimensional objects in two-dimensional space. Okay. There's a science to this. Parallel lines, as you know, if you were to stand on the train tracks, as you know, parallel lines converge in space. They come together to a point. So that is linear perspective using parallel lines. Imagine standing on, on the tracks and you're looking down the tracks. Where you're standing is called the vantage point. The point at which objects vanish is called the vanishing point. So where the train tracks all come together, the vanishing point. The horizon line is where, commonly known, is where the earth meets the sky. Also, your eyes, if you were to stand there taking a, a photograph, your eyes or eye level or the point of your camera lens, that is at the same point uh, as the horizon is. The horizon, though, is where the, the, the sky meets the land, but the vantage or the, the vanishing point is always also always on the horizon line. Here's a better picture of some train tracks. What we're looking at is something called one point perspective. One point perspective is where there is a single set of parallel lines and these parallel lines all converge in space at a single point. All sets of parallel lines converge at a single point. All of these diagonals are called orthogonals. When I say all of these, I'm suggesting there's more than just the train tracks. 
How many orthogonals do you see? Remember, orthogonals are the are the sets of parallel lines that converge in space. I actually did a quick count and I count 10 in this image. Of course, we have the two train tracks. We also have the edge of the railroad ties. We have the edge of the gravel. We have the bottom of the trees where the grass meets the trees. And we have the tops of the trees. All of these lines, all of these orthogonals are going to the horizon where the ground meets the sky. And they're landing at a single vanishing point. So here's a quick question as well. Where is the vantage point? Remember, the vantage point is the perspective of the viewer. Think about taking a photograph. Where your camera is being held, where that photograph is taken, is the, per the vantage point of the image and the vantage point of the viewer. So the vantage point is standing on these tracks and about five and a half feet off the ground, I would say. That is the vantage point. Five and a half feet being where your little eyeballs are. There are other lines in this image, and they are the railroad ties. If you notice, the railroad ties are going what's perpendicular to the tracks, meaning they are parallel to each other, but their vantage points are way off to the left and off to the right. We'll talk about that in a moment. But all of these parallel lines that are acting like a ladder going up, these are called transversals. Transversals are typically parallel to the horizon and perpendicular to the, to the orthogonals. Notice that transversals of even spacing tend to get closer together as you go into the distance. Look at the distance between the railroad ties at the bottom. They start getting smaller and they start getting smaller quickly and pretty soon you can't tell where the spaces are between the railroad ties. That's one of the properties of transversals. But as far as definitions go, again, orthogonals are the diagonal lines that recede into space. There, there are parallel lines that create these diagonals. The horizon line is where the ground meets the sky. It is flat and it is in front of you. The vantage point is where all of the orthogonals meet. I'm sorry, the vanishing, the vanishing point is where all the orthogonals meet. The vantage point is where you're standing or where the, the, the image is taken. And the transversals are lines that go perpendicular to the parallel 
lines that are receiving and receding into space. An illustration of one point perspective. We have a horizon line right there, right across the middle. We have a cube here, cube, and cube. These cubes are all square to each other. They're all parallel to each other. Therefore, we have a set of parallel lines here. One, two, three, four lines here that are all going to the vanishing point. And because this one is square to that one, we have these lines. These are also parallel going there. And these are parallel going there. One point perspective. This is a famous example of one point perspective. An old, old painting from 1509. This is painted on a wall in a room and it is I like this painting and I like paintings like this because it appears to extend the room. The room appears bigger because of the painting, because it is adding depth to the room. This painting is used with a technique of one point perspective. My question to you is I is to identify orthogonals in this painting. Remember, orthogonals are lines that would be parallel to each other, and because they are parallel, they are receding into space, getting closer to each other. Well, I see this is a big line. This is another big line. And they're coming down to right about here. I see a line that starts here and is pointing to the same place. I see a line that starts here and it points to the same place as well as a line that starts here. Even all the patterning on the ceiling there and there, these are all parallel to each other. Therefore, they all come down to the same place. These are all orthogonals. All the orthogonals are receding into space and they meet. they would meet together at again what's called the vanishing point and the vanishing point is right around here can you name transversals in this painting transversals are typically parallel to the horizon and they go perpendicular to the would-be parallel sets of lines in this instance, I see some major transversals, and those are these steps that they're standing on. This line here is transversal. The patterning on the floor, these are all transversals.
Now say you have your shoebox. If you have it right in front of you, that is one point perspective. But say you take that shoebox and you turn it 45 degrees, so you're looking right at the corner of the shoebox. Well, then you have parallel lines that are going in. You have two sets of parallel lines that are going in two different directions. Looking at this gas station, you have one set of parallel lines. All right, so this one here, these are all parallel to each other. And those are all vanishing to a point here. Then you have another set of parallel lines. that are vanishing over here. This image holds two sets of parallel lines. And these two sets go to two different vanishing points. That is the definition of two-point perspective. In two-point perspective, the imaginary sight lines that extend from the edges of cubes converge at two points on the horizon. Another illustration of that. So imagine these being your two, sh your three shoe boxes. As I was talking about before, you're looking at the corner. This corner is closest to us. You have the vertical lines but then you also have two other sets of parallel lines. This line starts here and it points to that vanishing point. So does this one. And this has a set that all points to the right vanishing point. But they also have lines that are parallel to each other in all three boxes, and they are all pointing at the left vanishing point. That is two-point perspective. Look at this painting and see if you can find an example of two-point perspective. Well, I am guessing that some of you, uh, most of you were able to pick this up, but this building in particular, this corner building, you're looking at the, at the corner of it, it's presenting two sets of parallel lines. One set that vanishes here on the horizon line, and then one set that vanishes here on the horizon. That is two-point perspective in practice. Time and motion. Actual motion refers to movements that we see and feel within our environment. Actual motion occurs in actual space. So you remember the apple that you were imagining and imagining holding earlier when we were talking about actual space. Well, if you take that actual apple and you roll it across your actual floor, you're getting actual motion. There are sculptures that actually move. But usually when you see motion in artwork, 
at least outside of moving sculpture, you have the illusion of motion. And so we will be talking about the actual motion, of course, illusion of motion, the elements of that, implied motion, where you're not actually seeing um, something moving, and implied time, where you're not actually experiencing the time it takes for something to move. This is an example of an artwork that actually moves. This is actual motion. Artists work with motion as they would with any other visual element. Kinetic art converts static images into active ones, or static objects. Film, video, or time-lapse photography can capture the effects of works of art that rely on actual motion. But film is not actual motion. And we'll talk about that soon. Imagine you're laying a child down in their crib and they have a spinning thing above their head. That's called a mobile. Well, this is essentially a mobile, like what would be spinning above a child's head. When you see this artist's artwork in real life, in museums, or what have you, you'll see things hanging from the ceiling or off to the side, and usually it's twisting and moving slowly like a mobile. In fact, the mobile, as we know it, was invented by this artist, Alexander Calder. So if you grew up with something like this over your crib, you can thank Alexander Calder for that. The illusion of motion. When artists use techniques to suggest that motion is in the process of occurring, they create the illusion of motion. These techniques include multiplication of images or fragments, blurred lines, and optical sensations. And this painting, called Woman Descending the Staircase, she looks like she's moving. Why do you think she looks like she's moving? Well, number one, I would say she's descending a staircase. You can't just stand like that. But number two, there is movement suggested through the blurred lines. Because the artist smudged the painting a little bit, it suggests to me that she is moving forward. This is an example of blurred lines. This is an example of multiple images. This is a very old photograph from the 1880s. Photography, as a side note, was only invented in about the 1840s. And technology wasn't very good. It got better through the 1860s, and it even got better in the 1880s. And it was around then that they were able to start doing photography that was much quicker. I'm sure you've seen old, old, old photographs from the 1800s where the person would have had to have sat in a chair perfectly still. Well, this image, uh, along with advancing technology and photography, allowed the artist to take multiple images. 
And with these multiple images, you really have the suggestion of motion. The illusion of motion. Another instance of the illusion of motion. These look like drawings because they probably are. But the photographer here, he never referred to himself as an artist. He referred to himself as a scientist. And for a long time, photography was in the realm of science rather than in the realm of fine arts. But he is the first person, Edward Moybridge, and that is not a typo. That is the strangest name, but I love it. Anyway, in 1878, Edward Moybridge developed the ability to take snapshots, snapshots that allowed for the multiple images of the running man before this. And his, in this instance, his objective, I think this is hilarious, but his objective was to finally determine the truth of when a horse was running at full speed, did all four feet leave the ground? And believe it or not, this was a debated topic. However, through his work in this photography, he was able to really prove that all four feet of the horse do leave the ground. And what he did to get this photograph again, these photographs again as a side note, is there was a racetrack and he had, what, 11 or 12 separate cameras set up and he needed the photos taken at just the right moment. So he actually set up trip wires for the horse to run through. And when the horse ran through the trip wire for each camera, the image was taken. And it was taken at just the right moment, at just the right distance. So again, this doesn't look like a photograph, and it might not be. I think what we might be looking at is an illustration depicting his photographs. So probably a drawing of his photographs. This is another artwork that suggests motion. This is a big, long painting, and I understand that this is hard to look at or if you have to look away. But why is it hard to look at? It's hard because the lines seem to be dancing. If you really stare at it, it can be hard to look at. The lines really start to dance. They really start to move. Word for that is called scintillate. But it is possible to use lines to create a sense of movement that where nothing is actually moving, but it act, but it really kind of feels like it's dancing around a little bit. So using lines in the right way and, and with repetition, you can get what really looks like movement. Our next definition is implied motion. Implied motion occurs when artists indicate motion without showing it. In works of art, implied motion in a figure may be suggested by the subject matter. So if there is a, per a person doing something in the work of art, uh, like brushing their hair, well, that's implied motion because it's implying an action. So this is a set of eight photographs. I love the title of this piece, 
throwing four balls into the air to get a square. Best of 36 tries. So why is this implied motion? Remember, implied motion occurs when artists indicate motion without showing it. Because it's a snapshot, we know that, well, we, we know it's a snapshot. We know that the balls are in the sky. So we know that balls can't, that go up, they come down. Even in the top left, we see a hand that really suggests that the balls were tossed. So again, implied motion. I think this painting really shows implied motion pretty well. Why? Because of their action. That's one reason why. They are lacing up their shoes, it looks like. Or maybe taking them off. But you also see the fabric on their dresses. The, the tool that is really sort of tufting up into the air. And you see you see lines, you see repetition of lines. You see the lines here, but you see something that looks like a shadow of the lines underneath it. Because of these shadows and this repetition, and because of the action, it's really showing implied motion and implied movement. There's also implied time. We don't see an action. In these three photographs, we don't see an action happening, but we see a story being told. And I'm telling you, it's a true thing that happened. This joker, the artist, allowed himself to stand in an art gallery and have his friend shoot him in the arm. We see before the shot, during the shot, and after the shot. This is implied time. Imagine a story. You can think of that. Stories require the passage of time. And if that passage of time has, has happened, if a story is being told, that is implied time. Motion occurs over time, so the two concepts are inextricably linked. It's implied time and applied motion. We know that the, emo that the motion is ha has happened, but because we're not seeing the motion, this is time. Implied time. Another example of implied time, I think this is hilarious. Uh, reading position for a second degree burn. Anyway, what do we have here? We have two images where it looks like he fell asleep. This is a photo taken of the artist. He falls asleep with a book on his chest. He's all pale. And then how long has it, what's, what's the time between the first image and the second image? I don't know, maybe two hours, two hours of, of laying on your back, allowing the sunburn to take hold. And then you see the shadow of the book. Well, anyway, that this is telling a story or putting two and two together. Another example of implied time. All right, this is the end of chapter five. Be sure to watch chapter six. And then after you're done with that, go ahead and take the quiz. The quiz will be on both chapters five and six.